Good mor morning, guys. This is uh, it's canine. This is canine freedom interview number four, and uh, today we have a very special guest here this morning. Uh, it this is Heather Beck, and she is my all-time best mentor ever. And just go on a little bit of recap. Um, back in 2013, when I went to when I was a senior in high school, like I was a baby and Heather could definitely vouch for Aww. that. Um, <laughs> and that was when I went out to uh, SoCal uh, LA to work with Caesar at the tra training Caesar's way. And Heather happened to be uh, my instructor back then. And it was crazy within a few years when I was in college that, you know, I signed up for her work, her 3D workshop up in Vermont. And that was in, um, 2016. I think or, so. I had to. I had to beg you to show up. You remember? Yeah, yeah. I remember. Yeah, she, <laughs> she, she had to really convince me that time. But I really, um, I really enjoyed it. Plus, I met so many great trainers up there, and it was such a fun time. And then my mom went off on a tandem, and you know, started uh, outbidding the the bid price. Yeah, for the a shadow program. Part. Yeah, for to come out for a private shadow program. Yeah, no, that, that shadow program was like the best experience I ever had. And just to have that one on time one on one time with Heather and uh, seeing her facility in person and help like, watching the, her run the socials and the and uh, walk the walk class. It was it was all great. And plus, the one thing uh, I really appreciate is her introducing me to the transitional leash, which I'll have her talk about because those are those are like one of the number one tools that I use for my clients and a lot of clients have have great results from this. So, um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's Heather, this Heather Beck and, uh, Heather, why don't you tell us, uh, where are you and, uh, your, your company and yeah. What, of and course. Yeah. And thanks for having me, Kevin. I appreciate it. We have been, uh, we have been friends and practically family now, I feel like for, you know, probably since right when we first met, um, I, I, I could probably tell a couple embarrassing stories about you, but I'll, I'll hold off on that. I, um, I'm sure everyone will enjoy that as well. That'll be like, <laughs> a bonus, that'll be like bonus content. Right. So anyway, um, yeah, I met Kevin in uh, 2013. I had just started working, uh, with Caesar as one of his trainers for the, uh, training Caesar's way, um, programs and, um, Kevin and his mom were out there and Kevin was just this, you know, bright eyed and bushy tailed kid. And, um, just to see, you know, as far as he's developed and, you know, to running his own business and to doing um, socials, which is huge. There's not a lot of people in the country that are actually doing that. So um, I'm, I'm really proud of you, Kevin. You've, you've made it happen. So, you know, I, I talk about you a lot. I talk about your ex your successes. I talk about, uh, I know I talk about uh, just how proud I am of you. You've really come so far and you've really taken it. You know, you've implemented everything that you that you possibly could. So. So anyway, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Heather Beck, um, and I own Canine Lifeline in Draper, Utah. Um, we do pretty much everything here. We run a very training-based facility. So we run daycare, structured daycare, training, obviously, as a training-based facility. Um, <clears throat> daycare, boarding, training. We do a little bit of grooming here and there. Not my not my favorite thing, but we have it available. Um, and so it definitely keeps me fairly busy. I've been doing that a long time. Um, I think I've been I've I've been working with dogs since about 1995, um, and I just can't believe how far and long it's been. You know, just thinking about it. And I've I've taught workshops for almost 15 years now. So I've had a lot of shadow programs, a lot of students, a lot of workshops. Um, our last workshop, uh, Jason Mesconi and I had our last workshop here. Um, ended February 29th right before COVID happened. So we were right under the wire with that, but I, I miss it. You know, I definitely miss thinking about scheduling even workshops right now. And um, we have a smaller workshop coming up in a couple of weeks with J Jack, but I mean, normally our workshops, our big workshops have anywhere from 50 to 60 people coming out. So um, so I've, I've had the benefit of mentoring and helping a lot of people. So, um, so you're one, but you're definitely one of my favorites. So. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I, you know, even though I know you like so long right now, I was still nervous just to interview you. I don't know why. Again, it was probably just because more formal and I feel like an equal, I guess. But I was just like, it's like, no, I have so, I've still got a long way to go, even though I've got 
<laughs> I've done so much on my plate. So there's still, I, I'm not a master yet. So well, I'm, and you know what? The one thing is, is it you never if you're doing it right, you never actually feel like that. You know what I mean? Like you always feel more like a perpetual student. Mm -hmm. And if you consider it that then you're going to be more successful. Like a lot of people that are like, oh, I've mastered this. That's when they like everything shuts off. They stop learning. They stop being open minded. They stop wanting to take more on, you know, so. Uh, but I do feel we've talked about it before. I do feel it is important to kind of have a niche and master it. You know, that's that's always my goal. But it doesn't mean that I'm not going to step outside of my niche and and learn other things, too. So that's important. Yep, be the master of something. Don't be a jack of nothing. Exactly. See, you got it right this time. <laughs> like, I got it right this time because yeah. I was like, I, I was like, like, what is it? How does it go? <laughs> I was like, I was like during the interview, I was like, oh my god, I'm like embarrassing myself. What did she say? And then I was like, okay, <laughs> it's but a no. lot of things, so it's it's okay to screw that one up. It's all right. <laughs> but no, I mean, I totally agree with the whole pick a niche like for me it was like I was just doing everything and then I figured out that you know my niche is like private private lessons and like my niche is just like working with the clients and um some behavioral issues because I did have I did do some service dog training but then I realized you know that wasn't my thing so it's like well that's a, that's a hard niche I mean that yeah. is a very hard niche you know it's I it's it's a very hard niche and it's very specific so it's kind yeah. of the same thing as like I I tell people well pick a niche that's actually going to help you to make a, a living you know if it's not a hobby and you want something to you know make a living with pet dog work is is going to be you know going to be the best way to go for sure yeah for sure and uh you know the other niche that i enjoyed because of because of you is uh teaching those socials and um like just seeing all these dogs that you know kicked out dog parks and daycare or you know got traumatized at dog parks and then now they're like terrors with other dogs you know just to see the your clients faces and say oh my god my dog can be in a group of dogs it's structured there's no one that's gonna just sit on their phones on the side and all that and I think we should probably just start with talking about how important socialization is and um, why the yeah. socials are, why the socials are so help helpful for almost all the dogs. Yeah, um, it's it's huge. I mean, it's definitely huge. And um, you know, one of the people that I worked with um, that kind of started socials, uh, I went to what I went to Chad Mackin's very first workshop that he ever did. I think it was me and like six other people may maybe. And uh, every once in a while, the picture comes up from that workshop. It's like me, Todd McVicker. I know Karen Laws was there. I think Tawny was there. I can't think. There's a, there a couple other random people, but um, went there and, you know, kind of learned a little bit about it. And then that first uh, Saturday or that weekend, we went to Jason's social. So, you know, at that, at that time, I didn't know what I was seeing. You know what I mean? I was like, but damn, I knew this was something I had to do. So immediately I went home. I got, uh, got into a facility. That's when I got my first facility was because I wanted to be able to run these socials for dogs. You know, I didn't want to do boarding. I didn't want to do daycare. I just wanted to have an indoor space where I could run these socials and uh, pretty much jumped right in. You know, I was running them really quickly after, um, after that happened. But previous to that, you know, it was taking me a year and a half to get a dog, you know, that was leash reactive to stop being leash reactive, you know, and that's throwing everything at them, you know, using head collars, using prong collars, using e collars, you know, and even then it was still just kind of heavy, heavy management. But then those same dogs, when I started running socials, those same dogs, I would have them in a group of dogs within, you know, five, 10 minutes socializing and being given that opportunity to actually really flex their muscles. So then when it came back to where they were going out on walks, all of a sudden they see a dog across the street and it didn't matter anymore. So um, very, very quickly, I, the realization of the benefits of socials made a huge difference in my training as part of, as part of a tool that I use. Um, and it's been it's been that way for as long as I've been running them and, and just to see the evolution, the dogs, how fantastic they, they develop just because of that, you know, and just like I said, something that would take me maybe a year, if never like to get that dog to a point that I can actually put them into a group of dogs very safely and have them learn and regain and maintain social skills that were beneficial outside of that. So it, it really is one of the, one of the most impactful things that I do. And, and since COVID, we've actually stopped running socials, which I will tell you, 
absolutely broke my heart because I see the dogs that need it. You know, I think one of the last socials that we ran, I was almost in tears because I knew that this this may be the end of, of what we're doing, at least for a little time, you know, and, and we haven't run them since uh, since March. And uh, and it, it just made me so sad because I know how much those dogs need it. We still have those dogs coming to daycare. We still see a lot of those guys. But the difference is when a dog can actually socialize with their owner in the picture, it's so different. It's a thousand times different than just a dog at daycare, you know, because the owner is in the picture 100 percent of the time. So just because we can get them to socialize in daycare doesn't necessarily mean that that owner could just walk that dog into a dog park and have success. So the difference is having that client involved in that process and having the dog be able to recreate the picture of how they act around the owner with other dogs and with other humans in the picture. So, um, but yeah, I'm pretty excited. We are making accommodations. So um, hopefully by next weekend, we're actually going to start running our socials again because I I just couldn't do without it. So I'm actually going to start running my first, very, very first outdoor social. <laughs> Ooh, and I'm super nervous. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's okay. I know we'll be successful, but it's, I've just never run an outdoor social. I've been to Jason's a bunch and um, it's never been anything I did. And, you know, we have seasons here, so it's hot, it's cold, it's snowing. So we'll see, uh, we'll see how it goes, but I just know the importance. So I'm really excited to get back into it and be able to run that. So. Yeah. I, I rem believe. yeah. I remember after the sh shadow program, I just jumped into doing socials right away. And it was like, I remember just doing it by myself one time and it was just like, maybe say started off with like six to eight dogs. And then like, once I had some helpers, then it was like, Holy crap. Next thing I know, we're having like 24 dogs or like um, the most I've had was like 28 dogs in, in social. And that was like, it was, it was not easy at first, but then it was like, it all coexisted. I was just like, cool. And yeah, there's so many dogs that, you know, that benefit are so much mm -hmm. because it's like, Hey, Jeff's um, on, Jeff Scarpino. That's somebody else that runs socials. Actually, Kevin and I were just talking before this, right, about how few and far between trainers that actually run socials are. I mean, I can literally only think about a, a handful. So it's uh, it's needed, but it's definitely, um, it's rare. You know, it's rare. And yep. it's I think it's because people are afraid. You know, they're afraid to let oh, yeah. dogs socialize. And, and it does take a high skill set to be able to do it safely. Um, you know, and not get dogs yeah. injured, hurt, killed, you know, and, and sometimes you may make those mistakes and it's, it's scary, but it's, you know, we are yeah. so proactive and preventative and that's how we keep it safe and functional. And, and our clients trust us, you know, they trust us with their dogs and we do everything to earn that trust and show them that we will do everything to keep their animals safe. And yeah, makes a big difference. yeah, no, absolutely. I have had my fair share of mistakes, trial and error, and, um, just, Every time, every time there's something up, there's a hiccup or something. I just bounce back and just make sure, okay, that's we. I mean, just make sure we don't repeat that mistake again, or just uh, we're just careful with that dog. Like that dog will, you know, like how your group does it. It's just like either those dogs are going to be on leash, but they can still be out and about they can still be on muzzle and that's a huge that's a huge step for a lot of those dogs like just yeah. i mean for a dog to be in the area next to their person even with our staff handling that dog you know even if it's on leash on muzzle being um you know being supported you know being having somebody be a supportive shadow to that dog you know we're not asking it to walk next to us we're literally just using the leash to kind of help guide them in and out of situations it's still that's a huge, huge, huge step for most of those dogs. And just like I said, even a dog like that, when they go and they're just out on a walk and they see that dog across the street, they go, eh, no big deal. No big yep. deal. So yeah. That's all. So yeah, de most definitely. Actually, Jeff Scarfino is one of the awesome people that I met at the 3D workshop. And uh, I, I saw Jason. That's right. Were you guys in Vermont at the same time? Yeah. Well, yeah. That's so funny just to think how far we've all come, right? That's crazy. Yeah. Same, like I met. I met him, his wife Jillian. Then I met Jason Cohen, both which are all been uh, big influences. Because, yeah, and um, don't forget, really Jeff actually came for the um, for the three D workshop. So he won the three D workshop at in Utah, and then came out for that too. So that yeah, was, no, that was it's awesome. a, no, they've been great network. They they've given me advice here and there. Jason Cohen has definitely uh, been lecturing me since he's from New York. So 
he does not show mercy like you do, Heather. So. <laughs> I'm gentler than Jason. That's awesome. That's you're so just a, you're just a tad bit <laughs> gentler. Just you know, he'll call me and be like, "What's going on, man?" I'm like, "Oh God." Um, oh, that's so funny. Uh, but yeah, no, it's like I've had dogs who can't be in other social situations. It's just or it's just like too risky, especially like the bullies or just dogs that are just. Um, questionable and then the owners are just like nervous to bring him out and i have had a couple of clients that are asking me like will i ever be able to take my dog to like to the beach or like um an off leash setting with my dog and then for me i'm just like and i don't know what and probably i want to hear your thoughts about it too it's like do you get like the it's so risky these days because everyone's just gonna like even if your dog gets scratched by a little your dog scratches another dog or like something of that sort it's just like you can get sued so fast or you can get yeah. like, so you well can get and, and honestly i mean i would say that most of those dogs are never going to go to a dog park you know like the really difficult dogs that come to us they're never going to a dog park they're probably never going to go off leash somewhere and with as strict as most places are about leash laws right now it's actually pretty rare for a dog to have a safe social interaction somewhere you know what i mean that actually is able to be off leash but once again you know i prefer that structure and discipline of what we provide because that's what keeps the dog in line so when mm -hmm. you go off let's say if you go out to the beach where it's maybe an off leash dog friendly beach or something like that or an off leash um dog friendly trail or something it's you don't have control of what the other dogs do you know so it's it or the can people really, yeah or the people you know so it really can put your dog into a bad situation and i'm all about protecting the dog i really want the dog to be successful and with those clients i just tell them you know hey let's be realistic i'm not ever gonna say no you can never do that but um protect your dog you know protect your dog or you know we do get clients that um you know we get the dog muzzle condition and the dog can go and and have a lot more freedom um out off leash and that kind of stuff but most of the dogs the difficult ones that come to us their best social interactions happen with us and the mm -hmm. people really cherish that you know because other than that it's isolation you know so we have a very unique environment that those animals can come and socialize where there's no other place in the world that they could socialize besides with us so that's a good thing yeah no i mean it's it's really um it's such a touchy subject because everyone wants their dog to like we they want trainers like us to make their dog like a golden retriever where they can just go up and just say hi to everyone and be super friendly and then it's just like in reality it's like your dog if your dog's really dog aggressive your dog is like a shark that you know if there's something going on and he jumps in like yeah, they're good. They're going to struggle. I mean, they're definitely going to struggle. So it's, it's part of being a really great trainer is managing expectations. I mean, it mm -hmm. really is. It's, it's managing expectations. So I mean, the, the caliber of dog that we get here, I don't BS anybody, you know, I just tell them, I'm like, hey, this is what we're looking at. And, you know, I'm not going to tell them, oh, your dog's going to be rehabbed and your dog's going to be amazing. And you're going to be able to go to the dog park and your dog's going to love puppies and your dog's never going to bite a kid in the face. Like, that's not that's not the conversations I have when it comes to difficult dogs. I'm you know me well enough. I'm brutally honest, especially when it comes to dogs, that it's just like, well, this is what we're looking at. But people usually appreciate that honesty, you know, because it's not. You know, I'm not trying to just sell them something, you know, right. I'm trying to really, truly help them. You know, I really, really have the best interest for them and the dog. And if they can't see it, it's my job to help to guide them to what a realistic life with a difficult dog is, you know? Yeah, no. And I, I totally get that. And I mean, it's just, um, you know, I, I don't know why I, I still have a little bit of difficulty when I bring, when I got to tell them like, well, your dog your dog definitely can't go out on the beach because if he does and something happens, it's going to be a crap show, you know, just because. Yeah. Well, here, Kevin, I'll give you, I'll give you another little tip. And I say this all the time, whether it's dogs or people, you cannot force acceptance. So you can give them the information, but you can't force that on them. You know what I mean? Like they're going to make their own choices. They're going to make their own decisions. And for me, definitely over the many years that I've been doing this, I've had to learn like, well, I'm going to give you the information and how you take it and how you do it is is going to be up to you. So yeah. sometimes we just have to let it go, too, because we can't force our agenda onto onto anybody, even though I mean, I've got some dogs that it is I call it the slow car crash. 
where it's like, okay, well, your dog is dangerous and wants to kill things and they don't see it at all, you know? And so to hear that when they don't recognize that is, is difficult, you know, they, they don't, they don't see it quite yet. And so it's uh, that slow car crash. And then of course, a couple months later, they get a hold of me and the dogs killed something or bit somebody and they go, Oh my gosh, that's so crazy. How did, I didn't, I didn't know it just happened out of nowhere. It's like, Oh, I, I tried to tell you, you know, but sometimes that draws them back into you to realize like, maybe you didn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's like, I wish, clients were more aware or like just like when you go out with your dog you also have to be really smart or just know like when's a good situation to if it's a good when's a good situation to put your dog in when it's not a good situation because people just want to go into the dog park and i tell clients all the time is like bring your kid to a shady ass bar where it's like <laughs> That's a great analogy. Yeah, like ooh, it, good times. Like they're not yeah. getting they're not getting good stuff out of that. That's just it, not. Yeah, something. it's just like you don't know what influences are out there. You don't know like uh, that person in the corner on their phone while their dog is while their dog is humping somebody or terrorizing someone. I'm just like telling them because I know even though I tell clients don't go to dog parks, I know here one or two here and there will go, and then I would just say be smart like at least watch the dogs that are in the so in the group beforehand and yeah. then like if it's bad you don't go at all if you go if if it seems cool go sweet short and sweet and get out and then yeah like, although yeah, or i really even just walk around the outside of the dog park i mean yeah. it's you know there's there's definitely times for proper socialization and there's definitely times for just you know maybe utilizing the dog park i mean for years before i had my facility i trained outside of the dog park you know that was where i met clients and then i would yep. work up to the fence of the dog park but, but i just have to say hi to one of my uh one of my favorite canadians ashley hey girl how you doing <laughs> i just see her posting some comments so hi yeah, miss yeah. you <laughs> yeah so i mean like i wish clients would just like be more proactive and just like find more, find safer ways to socialize their dogs, whether it's just like they get family members, dogs, or just uh, friends, dogs, and they met at their backyard, or if like they find a private property. Um, oh, she, she wrote a comment. I'm going to put it I up right here. Oh, I miss you. <laughs> we'll have Who to can... get together after, after the Ronas. We'll get together. We'll have a big party. <laughs> I better be invited too. You're always invited. Door's always uh, open. You know that. <laughs> perfect. Um, so yeah. And I just love, and everyone loves the fact that, you know, the concept of everyone walking in the, walking in the social, because, you know, just like how you said, you know, if the dogs, if the people stay still, the dogs stay still. And it just, it's like a, really awkward um handshake and then you know there's dogs that are like the guard owners and then it's just not a good it's just not a good time like literally i'm so ocd when i see social gatherings with dogs and i'm like why are you not moving i'm like keep i'm like keep walking dude right i know and so it's once you know <laughs> you know once you know what you know it's like you can't turn away like i can't go to like friends houses anymore where they're like yeah dogs welcome we're gonna have a barbecue i'm like no i'm gonna skip that because <laughs> i can't i can't handle it you know i can't handle the stress of like a bunch of dogs hanging out together with like just so much chaos because i can't or, focus on just hanging out so yeah it doesn't work yeah i know i'm just like where's my where's my uh where's my horse with where's the crop i'm just like yeah like where where is it in my hand um, i know right well we talked about it before this all dog trainers are control freaks so we can't help it anyway oh look yeah. jeff is jeff has one of my favorite little comments up there we aren't just dog trainers we're teachers mm, thanks yeah, yeah. That's, and uh, for Heather's case, she's the teacher of teachers. So she's like <laughs> a, a grand teacher or master sensei in a way. Um, oh, I try. But, it's it's not always an easy job, but I do. I love to help people. I want people to be successful. I want them to to have this as a career, not just a hobby. I want them to yeah. help people in, in productive, simple ways. Um, and that's, that's what I love to do. It makes a big difference. Yeah, no, for sure. So like... Um, Heather, how, what age do you, would you suggest when people get like a puppy, like uh, what's, what's the age you want to start socializing them? 
Oh, eight weeks. Easy. Eight weeks. eight weeks. Yeah. I mean, as soon as they come, ideally eight weeks, you know, sometime between, you know, eight weeks and 10 weeks, I like to see the dog in the home. Um, and then as far as socializing goes, I mean, starting immediately, because just think, I mean, they just came from a social setting, you know, so they were with mom, litter mates. There's no reason to not continue that. Um, mm -hmm. And I do often post um, that, you uh, that from the, the veterinarian about early socialization and the importance of it. So even for us, um, dogs will come into us if they're that young and they cannot come if they're coming from like a pet store situation or um, it, just kind of a random situation. But um, if they've uh, been vaccinated, they have one vaccination, they can, they can start coming to socials with us right away. Um, it's just so important and more dogs die of communicable or of behavioral issues than of communicable diseases. So mm -hmm. social dogs are happy dogs and it's going to make a difference in a lifetime. So if you socialize your dogs between that window of eight weeks to 16 weeks, properly socialize, not just throw them, you know, in the dog park. Don't just take them random places and let every idiot pet them or have the kids squishing them, but really taking your time to properly socialize them. Um, that window of time will have a lasting impression on that dog forever, forever, you know? Mm -hmm. So even, even dogs that have come to us maybe two or three times during that window of time, and we might not see them for a year, those social skills are still ingrained into them. And one of the things that comes up a lot, and I will preface this by saying I'm not a veterinarian, but one of the things that comes up a lot is that veterinarians are telling people like, oh, don't make sure they have all of their vaccines before you socialize them. There are yep. ways to socialize them with, you know, as long as they've got that first vaccination, um, you should start socializing them and exposing them to things, to kids, to cats, to other dogs, to chickens, if you want, you know, whatever things you want them to not be afraid of. Because what happens is people do all of that. And right when that last vaccine ends, which is right around 16 weeks, that's usually the time they get their third set. And also they get their rabies vaccine. That is when their first kind of fear period starts. So now let's say you've completely isolated your dog because you're terrified for it to get sick. You've completely isolated your dog. And now at 16 weeks, you haven't exposed it to anything. And now you try and throw it into the universe. Everything in the world is scary. So if you give them good stuff in that time frame from eight weeks to 16 weeks, then when they hit that fear period, that stuff is not nearly as scary. They may be a little bit more leery, a little bit more reserved, but it's not a, it's not a big deal. And the other thing I, I want to say about vaccines um, and vaccinations and dogs getting sick and things like that, it is just like the weirdest misconception that dogs will never get sick. Do you know what I mean? Like where people are like, oh, but my dog got kennel cough. And it's like, do you expect that you're going to go through your whole life with never getting a cold or never getting sick or never getting the flu or never getting strep? It's insane that people think that dogs would never experience that. And so for me, and definitely with my personal dogs, I really, really, really um, want my dogs exposed to a lot of other dogs because what it does is it helps to build up their immunity it's just like sending my daughter to when she started daycare was she sick all the time yes did we all get sick all the time yes but now that she started kindergarten it's not a problem you know what i mm -hmm. mean so it does help to build up your immunity so if we get a dog who has never been around other dogs and they come in around five six seven months old a lot of times they're going to, they're going to get something, you know, not that I want it to happen, but I can't stop it. Even if they're fully vaccinated, even if they've got their kennel cough, even if they got this or that, but just expect it's going to happen. It's not, it's dogs just don't live in a bubble and yes, they get sick. Sometimes they get belly aches. Sometimes they get fevers. Sometimes they get coughs. So just realize they're not immune from getting sick, which I feel is like a weird, weird, weird misconception of, of dogs. Yeah. I think we, I think we, sort of sheltered it the same way as kids where we're just like we're not we're not exposing them to so much because we're worried about that one time where that yeah time they're gonna get sick and it's just like you know me living with four dogs it's like each of them had their phase of like i had to bring to the vet or just like something happened i'm just like that's just that's just life man you know it's like you they, they just but they build that immunity and i had so many clients recently just because of everyone's been getting puppies just asking me, you know, it's like, oh, but the vet said I shouldn't bring him out because of Parvo and all things. And I'm just like, no, you can, if he has his first vaccination, like just 
just go yeah. to like parts you, you can do so you can do so much without doing a lot you know what i mean like even exposing yeah. them to different kinds of like flooring and things like that and we've got a lot of canadians on here hi britannia that's another one of my my favorite canadians um, yeah i met her at caesar's with you Yep, that's right. Oh my God, it's so crazy. It is such a small world. And we have all, we have literally all remained friends like over these years, you know, like to be able to see each other through workshops and things like that. Uh, yeah. Ooh, let's see what that's Ashley's it. got. Trey, I kept my distance because of COVID. She said, can't come near me and my dog because she hasn't had her third set of shots. I explained the point to her and she said, completely happy to stay far away from you while your dog sees and smells my dog. I want to stay away from because of COVID. But I really try to explain, even though there are part is still socializing and that yep doesn't need yeah. to be nose to nose yeah well and even dogs i mean even dogs when they're socializing doesn't have to be like the dogs playing together socializing can easily be dogs passing by each other dogs you know there there's so many ways to socialize you know it socialization doesn't just mean chaos crazy and especially um I heavily, heavily discourage any of my clients from doing on leash greetings of a dog of any age because you're so you're taking away some of those responses. So you're definitely taking away um, that that flight option and the avoid option, because if that dog is on a leash, you take all that away and it can really push them through either into fight or strong avoidance and really doesn't help much. So I, I really try and tell people like, hey, don't don't try and do an on leash greeting, especially with somebody you don't know. And this drives me absolutely insane every time I'm in the vet's office because everybody's taking their puppies there and they're like letting them like sniff. And I'm like, oh, it's driving me crazy. So, so I'm kind of picky about the on-leash greetings anyway. Yeah, no, I tell my clients the same thing. Like um, you treat, oh, so funny. like treat everybody, treat everybody, like, like get your dog to accept the pres presence of every dog in person without having them greet. It's like how us, we all go to the mall and we're like seeing all these people and we're not like yelling at them. We're not hugging them and all yeah. that. Um, well, and and this, is, this is the benefit of socialization though, too, is that because if that's the only thing you ever do is you don't allow your dog to greet on leash and your frustration, 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 the benefit of socialization is that they have that freedom to be able to interact with dogs properly and safely and so, you know, and, and really learn those skills so that when they are working on leash, this is why everything used to take me so long, you know, is that when they are working on leash, they don't have to feel so excited and get so frustrated um, that they can't greet that dog because they have exposure in other areas to be able to go and do that safely. So mm -hmm. it goes, it goes completely hand in hand. Man, we're getting super international. We've got Mate, um, she's in Mexico. So hello, hello, hola, Mate. Welcome. <laughs> right on, right. On. Yeah, I think this is the most engagement I've had. Just, I think because it's in your all your groups. So <laughs> I was like, yeah, I've got I was, my people. I've got my I was people. just, I was just like, oh god, this is bro this is gonna be broadcast and all your networking. <laughs> <laughs> like, all my people. Sorry, maybe, I love maybe, I love my people. Maybe this is why I was a little nervous because you shared it in like all the groups. I was like, okay. <laughs> it's all right. I wanted to I wanted to chat Saturday morning. What else are we doing, right? Saturday we're not, social. We're not running socials right now, so hey, there we right? go. <laughs> right, yeah. So it, it's just cra it's just crazy when people just like the socialization thing is just so broad. Everyone's just like, oh, they gotta see dogs, they gotta see people, and then like. Uh, leashes people like i've seen so many people get caught on leashes or just like tied up or you know their leash is so tight i'm just like oh. i was like i was like do me a favor you're gonna meet dogs like do it with like a family member dog or do it like with somebody that you know a dog that you already know and trust versus like a stranger dog i'm just like yeah well and that is that is such the benefit and why i wish so many more people were running you know structured socials or even structured daycare where it really is a it's a learning experience it's not chaos you know what i mean it's like we we call it doggy daycare but it's actually i mean it's a college level experience for most of the dogs that come to us you know that it really is there's a lot of learning going well, on they're here to learn you know Oh yeah, no, I really wish that, um, cause I've seen a couple of daycares in my area and I'm just like, I w I'm like, I was like, oh, why is there one person in the yard? I was like, oh, why you do you have a course crop? I'm just like, I'm like, I wish everyone was modeled in like that sense. But you know, I know in reality, it's not a, it's not everything's possible, but if well, I do- most, Unfortunately, most daycares run for the human, not for the dog. Mm -hmm. So they do what the human thinks the dog wants and needs, 
but they ignore what the actual dog benefits from, you know? And so when clients come to us, I explain that to them. That's why I tell them we're, we're a training based facility. So we have a lot of structure. If you want a Disneyland daycare, there's 20 of them here. So, I mean, that's, that's it, you know, talk about having your niche. That's not us, you know? So if that's the experience you want your dog to have is chaos and out of control, then you can go to that daycare. And then when they get kicked out, then they can come back. So, <laughs> yep, yep. but I wish it was more prevalent. I really do. I try my best to teach people to, to run those kind of socials or, you know, at least the daycare type stuff, but it's, it's just not as prevalent as I wish it was, but that's sure. kind of my, one of my life goals is to make it more common so that we can help more dogs. For sure. I mean, it helped my dog. Like when I was doing my cross country trip, like I had my, and you were dreading when I, when you told, when I told you I was getting a Malinois and you're like, no, don't get one. I'm like, sorry, she's on her way. <laughs> I know. And I was then, like, Kevin, what are you doing? It sorry. was, uh, it was like, well, it was a, it was a curse and a blessing at the same time. Yeah, like, no, I, she's, she's a good, she's a good girl. I mean, she's definitely a good girl. You've done, you've done well with her and she's not, She's not crazy. She's not, you know, I hate when people always say like, oh, Malinois are this, Malinois are that, but hey, Nova. Hi, honey. It's Auntie Heather. Hi, sweetheart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi. We're gonna, we'll get that. We're gonna go back there to do GRC. Don't worry. Oh yeah, that's for sure. But I yeah. mean, the thing is, is that you know, every dog. I don't care what breed it is. Every dog has a temperament and a personality. You know, so they're just because it's a Malinois, you can get a Malinois that isn't freaking bouncing off the walls. You can teach them to be calm. You can teach them to have an off switch, even if it's a higher drive Malinois. It doesn't matter. But you know, I hate when people make those justifications that, oh, it's, it's this breed of dog. So it's impossible for you to handle. And, you know, so it's, it, it drives me crazy, but uh, Nova, I think is a good match for you. I think she's taught you a lot. I think that you've, uh, you've done really well with her. So we, congratulations. Yeah, no, she was, uh, we definitely butt heads. We still have, uh, we still have our, <laughs> we still have our moments and that, and that was the other, and like, I, she, my roommate told me how much she's so much she's like me so much like um like sometimes i do tend to over correct dogs here and there and then apparently that that's what my, that's what she does too and i'm just like lovely that's the one thing i didn't want i did not want to i did not want this dog to inherit from me it's just you know but she's but like yeah two the first two years that i had her terrible like four months old super dog reactive then we brought her to the workshop still was reactive and yep. i and um we went down to utah to see heather and we brought her into the social group and it was it was so cool it was like yeah she got it she got a pretty decent correction right at the beginning though where i kind of was like oh all right that was a little I, heavy but but i mean it, it basically kind of got her thinking so it was like okay that's stop the crap and let's let's get you thinking clearly and a lot of times when they're reacting, they're just not thinking, like they're just seeing something and they're just going stupid. So like just yep. to say, hey, stop it. And then we walked her right in and she did she did fantastic. So that's, you know, that's that's so that, good. Yeah, that's what really got me to want to jump into doing social so fast. Like when I got over there, just because I know I have clients that have dogs like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like ever since um, when she hit two and a half years old, she was just really good like i yeah been, took a I little took a little growing up it's funny ashley said that that she was working at a daycare so it, she kind of had that same lesson and i always tell people in advance like before they come and work with me or before even like a lot of my staff when they work here i just apologize because i just say hey i am so sorry because you will never see dogs and dog socializing and things to do with dogs you will never see them the same again and once you know you can't unknow, you know, I call it the burden of information. Like I've given, I've given a, I've even written an article for the IACP um, journal about the burden of information and what happens. Like once you know something, you can't unknow it. So like with Ashley, she had to get out of working in that situation because it's stressful. This is why I don't go to the dog park. It's, I know too much. I know too much about dogs and dog behavior for me to actually like not have a meltdown there. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty tough no for sure and like um just just how just you know just with the transitional leash and how you train and just using uh distance pressure like you use you use space and training to like you know calm the dog down and have them in a lower position and like sit and then you walk away like that that um 
just seeing that is so it's so great versus like other Daker groups that are either like they're gonna pull the dog out or score bottle or just like um you, you know it's like the dog is still not calm. Or the well, dog they don't. Most not. daycares just don't. They can't. This is why they have to limit the types of dogs that enter into their daycare. So like the caliber of dog in our daycare and our adult dogs, we have three different groups. But in our adult dogs, eighty to ninety percent of those guys came to us for human dog aggression or both. But yet we don't have incidents. We don't need to use squirt bottles. We're not trying to. You know, we don't have incident reports. We don't have blood drawn. We don't have stitches. We don't have. You know, we can stop anything that happens and very quickly. But it is because of the big, big, big reason is because we control space. Mm -hmm. So we can control space and we can slow and stop behavior. And if you cannot do that in a daycare, it's it's not safe. Like it's not safe. Like if something happens and even if it's excited play, if you can't stop it and you don't have a way to stop it, excited play, reactivity, aggression, all of that stuff can be on the same page and it can turn from play to killing in seconds and so that's so 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 important is to control space and we teach that obviously in our daycare we teach it in our training you know we do our our five steps program um, that we teach throughout to our training clients and obviously we utilize the transitional leash a lot in our training um, but everything is about controlling space you know controlling space who moves whose feet who can slow down behavior and that's that's the most imperative thing when running groups of dogs together for sure yeah for sure and like um I know we're, I know it's like almost, I, I know it's 40 minutes, but I wanted to like get a little <laughs> bit more. I want to get more in touch with like using space, like how important sure. space is in dogs. Cause I know like, um, like you always mentioned how space is just as valuable as like food, uh, water, all those, all those like, um, valuable resources. But I would like, say it's one of the, I would say it's one of the most valuable resources, but the one that most people never think of. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, oh, the dog jumps on me or the dog bolts out the door. Or the dog does this. So when you think of when most people are pulls on leash, you think of all of these things that people tell you about bad behavior. Most of it has to do with controlling space. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, a dog's barking when a dog's barking. They're trying to control space, whether it's to get out of a situation, whether it's to get to a situation, whether it's, you know, so there's a lot of that. If you start to think about it, most problems have to do with controlling of space. So I do feel it's it's one of the most important ones, but definitely one that most people don't consider. Yeah, because I mean, just like, um, just the fact that we have dogs that bark at the door, like, um, I don't know. I don't know. Can you, it's, well, I have a struggle with fence fighting with my, with like uh, my neighbor, with their pity on the other side. And like I tried using space. So I tried to use the distance pressure, but like with all four of the, with four dogs going at it with the one dog, I'm just like, uh, okay, this I gotta be easy. This is probably easier if I just had the one dog, but you know, yeah, it's hard. Go. It's hard with four dogs and with a situation like that. Um, you know, it's un unfortunately when something like that happens for like every one time that they actually get away with it and practice that bad behavior, you have to not allow it to happen like 10 times for it mm -hmm. to actually start to correct. So if you mm -hmm. see that, you know, with all four dogs, I mean, technically you'd have to walk each of them out individually. You'd have to, you know, um, try and keep them from doing the barking at the fence, you know, or be able to recall them off of the fence. So it's yeah. it's it's a hard situation to manage, especially that, that fence fighting, because man, it is so rewarding to the dog. It's so adrenalizing. It's so fun. <laughs> you Leave know? it. Well, the thing, well, you know, leave it to my dog, the the Malinois, the adrenaline junkie to go for it. And I'm just like, yeah, and it just encourages everybody else too. I had a German Shepherd that did the same thing. And it was, you know, I mean, every time she would go out in the yard, it was just like straight beeline for that one spot in the fence where our neighbors had two Huskies that were out all the time. And it was, it was a mess. So I, I worked with her a bit. I did use a bark collar in that situation. So, I'd, so I didn't have to correct her that she was kind of dealing with that. And that actually, that actually stopped the behavior. It was, I was pretty lucky with that. Cause it's not always, it's not always what it is, but that's, that was um, the solution for that, for that yeah. one situation. But I don't always recommend it cause it might not work, especially if you've got multiple dogs like mm -hmm. that, you know, feeling the stem of the bark collar may cause them to redirect onto another dog near them. So it was, for me, it was just dealing with one dog and that was the solution for that. But it's a yeah. fun part of training is figuring out how to be creative. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah. I mean, I've been managing it and then I also have just like that extra barrier, like away from the fence. So they can't get all the way to it just because, you know, it's always just like the fact once they're at that fence with that dog, it's just, that's when it's game on. Like if I, 
I put the X pen up and I put like two feet up. I put two feet away from it and they're like, oh, is it, they can't get all the way to it. I'm like, okay, cool. Now yeah. it's just, now it's just that one, it's always the empty part of that fence where that pity is just right. trying to find it. Well, and the thing is too, is that, you know, I mean, being a, being a trainer and having issues with your own dogs, you know, I mean, if you, if you're a dog trainer and you've never had a difficult dog, you're not a trainer. You know what I mean? Like you don't, it doesn't give you that empathy to clients, you know, like to have a difficult dog or to have a dog that isn't perfect or to, you know what I mean? It teaches you a lot about what your clientele might be going through instead of being like, well, why don't you just do this? But yet you've never had to live it. You know, it's unless you're living it, you don't know what's going on with it. And even if it's not the exact situation, you can understand the frustration and the struggle um, that goes along with it. Like yesterday morning, perfect example. I'm here and uh, we have this uh, great Dane that's coming into us just for daycare. We haven't done training with them. He's two years old. Um, and he comes in Well, the woman's waiting outside and I go to walk past and he goes nuts. He's just barking at me. And he started to do this in daycare too. And so I said, Hey, you know, I really, you know, Hey, you know, we can help you with that. You know, we do training. And so she, uh, um, she told me that he had just bit her that morning. So he had turned and redirected on her arm and actually broke skin. And when we got him in, got him into the building, she just broke down crying, you know, like she just broke down crying as to all the bad things that were going on with him and how he was starting to go after other dogs. She has five dogs. And, um, you know, and I just totally empathized with her, you know, I mean, I was totally heartbroken for her and, and just gave her some, some suggestions and obviously training was one of them, but they don't need, you don't need to struggle like that. But if I was just, you know, yelling at her, like your dog's a jerk, it's your fault, blah, blah, blah that would have been very different than how I approach that situation because I do feel for her. I know what it's like to be bit by your own dog. I know what it's like to have, you know, a difficult dog. And if you don't, it's hard, you know, it's really hard to have that empathy for clients instead of just telling them what to do and not being able to, to get on board with that, you know, and plus they'll know it too. You know, they'll know it too. They won't believe right. you. You're not believable. They won't respect you. They won't trust you. So, I mean, we had, she cried, um, I empathized. We talked about it. I sent her some information and we're going to get him signed up for training. So awesome. it's, uh, yeah, yeah, he's a, uh, he's a good boy. He wants I, to be. Yeah, no, I mean, I empathize with the owners too. And I tell them, I'm listen, my dogs are jerks too. I mean, like my, dog, like, <laughs> like, no, like Nova, you know, she, she really over corrects now where it's just like, it's like a switch where it's just like, if someone, if a dog tries to hump her, then she's like, she's on their face. And I'm like, and she grabbed, and then she, and then like, it happens like once or twice. She's even overcorrected one of the dogs here on my roommate's pity just because, and she's, and we've had her since a puppy, but you know, she, she, she bothers her a lot sometimes. And I'm just like, why can't you just take the corrections just a little easier and we'd be happy. <laughs> because she's like, teaching you. She is your teacher. Yeah. And you can see all the, all the trainers, the same thing. I'm just saying, Hey, you know, people, it makes you real. You know what I mean? Like it makes you real. It makes you humble. It makes you, you know, somebody that they feel isn't just trying to belittle them because they have a difficult dog, which it's already sucks when you're dealing with a difficult dog. You don't want somebody talking down to you about it. So it does, um, help a lot when you've been in that situation and you can you can really really empathize with the client so it makes oh, a huge difference yeah no definitely and yeah i mean just yeah just using that space is so important because just be just because dogs jump on people dogs jump on counters dogs beg at the table um and the and like um there was this one more question before we finish up just um, You're good. I, have, I have a client with a pit pitbull chihuahua mix and it, she's and she likes to guard, she guards the owner mm -hmm. around dogs. So like, um, I know that's more of a management thing, but it's like, I, but I do know it's just because the dog is owning the owner's space. Yeah. Um, how, like when it just working on like distance pressure, just using, just having the dog respect the space, like it's that like, I'm more, I'm just more curious versus just like wanting like a training answer. But like, you were like, do you see that more like, can the, you see like the dog not guarding the owner as much use around other dogs if we you establish space right or is it just absolutely just more, yeah. absolutely and when we like when i talk about my five step process so it's you know step one is basically you know teach the tool so it doesn't matter the tool we do a lot of the transitional leash just because it does help to calm the dog it's got the pressure across the bridge of the nose 
um, teach the tool. Uh, basically, step one. Step two is moving forward together. So then walking, you know, getting the dog moving and walking on a nice loose leash. And then step three, you know, so in those first two steps, you are teaching the dog to kind of respect pressure through the leash work, which is what we call contact pressure. Then we move into step three, which is step three is unfixed space, which basically is a bed, anything like that. And when I have dogs that are that are possessive of the owners, it is so imperative that they start teaching the dog to move away, to get away from them, to be in a certain area, not always underfoot and not always right next to them. So being able to translate what they learn through the leash work into eye contact and body language. So we always start with the leash work because if you try and start with just eye contact and body language, the dog's probably gonna practice flight. The dog's probably could practice fight. I mean, if it's an aggressive dog and you go to step into them with eye contact and body language, they don't understand what you want. So when you make it simple enough with them to start with the leash work, then go into the eye contact and body language of using a, a bed or a fixed space and then translates into step four, which is unfixed space, which means like you could do it just anywhere, just of creating space around you. But it's step three and step four for a reason is because you've taken the time for the dog to understand that the concept of pressure should mean to calm down. You know, it doesn't mean to go into fight. It doesn't mean to go into flight. It, you know, it should mean to calm down. So that's what we're really, really, really trying to encourage. And, um, you know, then when you get to that step three and that step four, the dog already has some sort of concept of that. And then your eye contact and body language actually means something. So yeah. and it's important. It's just important for the dog to start realizing that they're not possessive of you and that they don't control the space around you. And so that's where you're tweaking it, where you're changing that that concept of the space. Yeah. Oh, my hey, mom. mom. <laughs> uh, my mom loves you so much, Heather. She... I love your mom too. And hey, Winnie, thank you so much for that um, that beautiful canvas you sent us with all those amazing um, pictures um, of Izzy and our family. It's hanging right above her crib, so we love that. Um, and yeah. Ashley, you gotta start making cots too. We have cots. We get them from uh, from four legs, four, four legs. pets. Yeah, they those, yeah. those guys do great cots. I, I can't. I can't keep up in the cot game. Those guys are fantastic and they put your logos on them. So reach out to those guys. Yeah. Uh, but also I want to say our training, like a lot of our training stuff. So Kevin, when you're dealing with a client like that too, goes hand in hand with crate training, giving the dog, you know, that is one of those really impressive tools that gives the dog time to be away from the owner, you know, and the owner to rest. And I did just get, um, I just finished a crate training video. So I was I, yeah, I was going to do a shout out for your, yes, I was finally, finally going to do a shout <laughs> yeah, well, out. I couldn't find one. I kept, I'm like, doesn't anyone have a crate training video? But everyone yeah. that I saw was just a lot of, you know, uh, games and a lot of food and, you know, but not nothing that goes along with how we teach crate training, you know, and how we do, yeah. how we do it the way that, that we do it in our training. So I'm so happy to finally have that out. So, um, yeah, yeah please share that away. Cause that's, it's so important to have that downtime and rest and, and yeah, pair no, it like sure. that. And that's a big part of controlling space, huge part of controlling space. Yeah, guys. So like, uh, for those that are not in Heather's group that are like on watching through my Facebook, you know, it, Heather has this great um, YouTube channel. She goes over the five steps that uh, she's talking about. She's gone over um, how to condition the transitional leash. And if you not have, if you have not tried one, buy a couple. Like it's a game. It is a game changer. You know, it's like uh, I can't. I used to not like head halters and like the uh, things over the nose, but now I utilize it just so much just because of. Heather's teaching or you know even better go to a workshop when Heather has a workshop go go sign up there and you know go watch Heather's uh YouTube channel or join up join her uh yeah I've got Canine Life Lifeline so. Live which is our basically my interactive training page um I also have one for clients um which is Club Canine um but they're just subscription monthly subscription so every for Canine Lifeline Live it's $29 a month um, but man, we give it all away there. We give it all away there. So anyone that's on Canine Life on Live, you guys see everything that we're dealing with. You know, we talk about socials, we talk about business. Um, we've been dealing with some COVID puppies, you know, dogs that have had zero socialization and it's 99% video based. So video based and interactive. So I don't sleep. I didn't before that. Um, but now I've got a, a three month old baby at home, so I'm really not sleeping. So I'm, I'm super happy to answer any time that you guys have questions in there. It's, uh, it's amazing. So canine life on live, come see me for a workshop. Um, right now I am setting up, um, private 
shadow programs, but I'm only doing it for three days at a time because that's when I'm available. So Friday, Saturdays and Sundays, and those are just kind of on a request basis. Um, and also the Canine Lifeline Transitional Leash, you can check out the store. So it's caninelifelinestore.com. And that has a bunch of videos. So the five-step video is on there. Um, a conditioning video is on there. And just like Kevin said, if you haven't ever worked with the head halter, get over it. Give it a shot. You know, I mean, I get so many people. I, I think about this a lot where I get a lot of trainers that tell me how and why it doesn't work. But yet they've never, ever, ever, ever tried it. So how could you tell me something based on your theory when in reality I have worked with that tool on tens of thousands of dogs and had amazing success? It's very client friendly. It's very easy to teach. Is it the right tool for every dog? Absolutely not. But that's why we have a larger toolbox. So take some time to learn about the transitional leash. And there's a ton of resources out there to help you do it. You can reach out to me directly as well. Just like I said, I'm available. Follow me yeah. on Facebook. Follow me on Instagram. I'm around. <laughs> yeah, no, no, she does not sleep. I'm for, I have I've messaged her late at night and she's still she's still awake. I'm like, oh, okay, so I was like, okay, cool, she's awake. Um, but yeah, it's and this is my favorite quote from you, uh, Heather. Just uh, you know, because not even not even involving just the transitional lease, like a pinch collar, e collar, all of that. Like you know, it really depends on who's using the tool rather than the tool itself. So it's it's always it's the fool, not the tool. Yeah. So that's that's such an important thing. Um, and, and it's like, important, you know, it's important. It's it, just like I said, I mean, you can use any tool, you know, and if you have, a, you know, a thought of a tool, this is what I tell people, like, if you have a thought of a tool, and you don't like it, and you've never worked with it, train at least five dogs on a tool you hate the most, then you can at least have some insight to it. And you know what, there may be that one dog that comes along that, hey, you know, I need to use a tool on this dog that I'm not necessarily comfortable using, but at least then you're ready to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. It, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, but when, when people talk about that, that term that I absolutely hate balance trainer, it's balance to everything, you know, it, it should be, it should be balanced. Like, Hey, you understand head halters. Hey, you understand the difference between so many of the head halters that are out there. You understand, um, you know, e-collars, you understand prong collars, you understand harnesses you understand the tools. Like if you truly call yourself a balanced trainer, but yet you have some hatred for some tool out there, then that's, that's, that term goes right out the window. <laughs> yeah, so. no, I, yeah, no, I, I agree. I experiment with all different kinds of tools and, you know, it's just like, it just really depends on the client. It's like a doc, it's like for me, it's like a doctor. I can't prescribe everybody the same medication like all the time. Yeah. So it's just, uh, it really varies, but, um, I, and people see my, and I've seen a couple people with my leashes out on walks all the time. And Isn't that uh, fun? Yeah. I love that. Yeah, and we put logos on those too. So anyone, um, you know, you can definitely or your um, dog's get your name. logo. Yeah, or your dog's name. You can get your logo. You can get your dog's names. Um, once we get your logo set up, we'll just put it on every order that you that you make from us. Um, so yeah, check out the leashes. We love selling to trainers. Um, we also have our One Leash, One Life program, which is um, we give a huge discount to nonprofits. We also donate a ton of leashes. So if you guys know a rescue that really um, would benefit from some Canine Lifeline transitional leashes, I got a bunch sitting in there right now that we could send right out to them. So feel free to reach out to me and, and recommend a rescue because I, I love donating leashes as well. And that's just part of that One Leash, One Life program. Yeah, you know, it's just um, they make they're making an impact here down in, up in North California, and um, <laughs> just, uh, I def I have to restock on more. I definitely want like that um, new uh, green that you guys got. That one oh, looks really cool. Oh yeah, we cool. got some we got some nice new colors, and they're really pretty, and we love them. So it's uh, it's good, and we got our slip collars too. So we started. Uh, we're almost. We should have our slip collars on there in the next, uh, uh, probably this next week. And also, you know, we do regular slip leads. We do long lines. We do, we can custom make anything. So if there's something you want that we don't have listed on the website, reach out. We can pretty much make just about anything for you. Right on, right on. Well, all right, guys. So it's almost an hour, almost an hour. And, uh, you know, Heather and I have lives that we have to get do. Busy, do so. busy people. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I want yeah, so I want to give a shout out to Heather, you know, not just for this, like, I really appreciate the interview, but, you know, just for everything you've done for me, you are Aww. a fantastic mentor, and, you know, I'm never going to stop complimenting you, giving you shout outs, and, um, you know, I preach about it all the time, so I really, 
appreciate Thank it. You. Like, like you're like you're up there in the high table for me, and I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're there, man. You're there. Don't uh, don't discredit yourself. You've done so much for dogs and, and owners and and you should be really proud of where you're at. And I, I know I am. And I know, uh, you know, you've really helped a lot of people. So keep up the great work, Kevin. It's been it's been an honor to be part of uh, part of your path. <laughs> the, the honor is mine, Sensei. You know, it's just. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, guys, you know, if um, any any of my dog trainer friends that don't know Heather, you know, check her out. Uh, any of my clients, check out her YouTube, a lot of good content. And um, yeah, let's just keep. And if you're struggling out there, just, you know, contact a local trainer, you know, with COVID, Definitely. everything is just chaotic. And um, you don't need to struggle. Reach out for help. That's for reach sure. Reach out for help. But um, awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Heather. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Everybody have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, right, if you have questions, it. I'll keep monitoring this. So thank you so much. All right, guys. Peace.